Pineda. And uh, Christy comes to us with a wealth, wealth of experience um, and education. She is one of the probably, um, I'm going to call you, but I say it with, with respect, grandmothers and instigators of palliative care. She's been, she's recognized nationally um, and really um, has been in on the ground floor at George Mark. And here, at the very, very first conference we had in Emeryville, was responsible for developing it. And I consider myself a novice to the field, but it's really wonderful to be able to acknowledge that we're a team, and Marta is part of our team. And we want all of you to feel comfortable being part of the palliative care team as it reflects uh, your interest in, in patients, um, so that we can deliver a really robust product to our patients. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your... No problem. Um, I don't have a whole lot of slides, and I completely bypass slide rule number one. There's a lot of information on the slides. And that was because I wanted you to have the information on the handouts. There's also the position statement from the Emergency Room Nurses Association and the joint collaborative position statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the, emergency, the College of Emergency Room Physicians or Medicine, and the Emergency Room Nurses Association as well, um, attached to the PowerPoint handouts. And I lifted freely from those resources as well as a couple of others that are listed on your references um, at the end of the slides. I really do um, uh, am open to questions, so stop me at any time. I do tend to talk fast, and the faster I talk, the squeakier I get. <laughs> so feel free to you know, tell me to slow down. Um, and then I, since we're a small group, can we just go around the room real quick and introduce ourselves? Or yourselves? Hi. She Hi. already introduced me. <laughs> I'm Linda. I'm Linda. in the emergency room. I'm Manny, I'm a child life specialist in the ER. Debbie Fong Kong in the ER. <laughs> and Linda Moore, also a nurse in the emergency room. And I'm for an educator. Well, it's nice to meet you all. Um, the objectives, I try to keep them pretty simple based on what Fran and I had communicated. Um, just to review the, the principles of pediatric palliative care, discuss how to integrate it into the ER, um, identifying where it can be integrated and how it can be integrated. Um, one of the things, this is a new emerging source of research uh, for palliative care in um, the integration of pediatric palliative care into uh, the emergency room. It's not a new concept, but there hasn't been a lot of formal work in the field. Some basic facts. Um, most emergency rooms uh, see patients of all ages, um, so do you, depending on where they're coming from. Um, many more patients these days with chronic complex conditions who are living much longer than they ever did before with the advances in medical technology. They often need pain and symptom management and often end up in the emergency room just due to the anxiety of their caregivers and um, their support care needs. Overall, up to one-third of the emergency room deaths are due to the effects of chronic diseases. Studies in children have sh shown, that's a typo, sorry, that life-limiting conditions report about 3 to 20 percent of the deaths for children in the emergency room. So that's a significant number if up to 20 percent of your children who die in the emergency room are dying from chronic complex conditions, um, all of which should be uh, receiving palliative care. The WHO, World Health Organization definition of palliative care, and again this is on your slides so I'll go over it a little quickly. Palliative care for children represents a special advice closely related field to adult palliative care. It's appropriate for children and their families as follows, and the principles apply to other pediatric chronic disorders 
that might not be listed. It's an active care. It is active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit, and also involves giving support to the family. It begins when the illness is diagnosed and continues regardless of whether or not a child receives treatment directed at the disease, so whether it's curative treatment or life prolonging treatment, or when it becomes just comfort care at the end of life. Health providers must evaluate and alleviate the child's physical, psychological, spiritual, and social distress. Effective palliative care requires a broad, multidisciplinary approach that can include the family and makes use of available community resources. It can be successfully implemented even if the resources are limited. And if um, you went to the two-day conference back in July, is it? Yeah. You saw time. some uh, videos of a pediatric palliative care program in Africa and they do a great deal with very, very little. And there's more pictures upstairs in our mm -hmm. offices. It can be provided in tertiary care facilities, the community, and in the home. So palliative care is delivered by an interdisciplinary team, provides ongoing pain and symptom management, and encompasses the domains of physical, psychological, social, and spiritual care for the child and their family. One uh, graphic shows that it, palliative care should start at the time of diagnosis all the way to supportive treatments and then assisting with bereavement support after the child's death. Another graphic that um, we like is the umbrella. Um, the umbrella of pediatric palliative care supports all types of care under which that child fall, falls from the time of diagnosis until after death and bereavement, including anticipatory guidance and end-of-life care. But palliative care is not end-of-life care. And if I can add, I think uh, that one of the really important and quite elusive, illuminating studies um, done in the last five years show that when children were in palliative care, they lived longer and their quality of life was better. So that if we really are addressing the needs of the family, keeping the kids out of the hospital, perhaps sometimes even advocating for non-aggressive therapies, but providing good supportive and comfort care, in adults in particular, and I think it's been shown in children, but I'm not 100% sure, they lived longer and they all said that their quality of life was better. Most recent research that I found was 2014 that demonstrated that children that were followed with the palliative care team um, did not really see a decrease in emergency room visits, but did see a decrease in length of stay and an improvement in quality of life. Um, and family satisfaction. Um, but the ER was still a safety net for these families, as they, they often are. And the, one of the reasons is we have limited community resources to support them in their home. Um, so the, the emergency room often becomes that bridge. This is a short, well, Sorry, I'm used to a mouse. Um, short video from. I don't, I don't know. You don't know if it's going to work? I'm not sure. Is, can you get the mouse onto it? Um, there it goes. I think you're on it now. Cannot locate the internet. Oh, because I don't have internet. Okay, well, that's computer. okay. It's a three minute um, video of a. Pediatric palliative care emergency room physician, oh. um, and the importance of palliative care in the e ER, and some ways of thinking about it. So you've got the link. It's a YouTube try. video. Can you try um, it, friend? So even an adult emergency room is still a relatively new 
concept? It's palliative care only became a subspecialty in 2006. So officially, it's only been around for 10 years in the United States. Um, the pediatric world lagged behind the um, adult world, but the United States overall has lagged um, behind in palliative and in end-of-life care. Um, the first real research on this started in the 80s, but very, very little until 1999. And the first actual report was from the Institute of Medicine in 2003. So it's a very young field mm -hmm. um, when you think about it in those terms. I think we're so curative. We think of cure versus palliative. That's the medical model. But, but, it, but it won't in, show but up in there, fact, I have it on here. I would, I would okay. suggest to you that a lot of oh, the cardiac why? surgeries we do for congenital heart disease um, or palliative mm -hmm. surgeries, the there's no, That's because the, the kids are not cured. normal and cured at the end of it. And if you really want to argue about um, a lot of cancer chemotherapy, a lot of gene therapy, a lot of patients with cystic fibrosis, though all of those patients are not even thinking about a cure. They're thinking about quality of life and being able to live the best life that they can for as long as they can. It means that's like sickle cell hemophilia across the board. That's, I think that's right. And I think Although I don't know that parents understand that. They may, they may not, although I think on some we level yeah. they may actually find it easier to deal with what they have to deal with step if they step. understood that there was a lot more support in sorry. the community. No, I've not I'm yet sorry, found a family this is, this is my own who has been in palliative care who hasn't said, I wish I'd known no, about it the earlier. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's what people's perception is. Yeah. 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 Because people think palliative care means in a life. Yeah. And some people are in denial about that. And There's it did in the beginning. Things. In the beginning, yeah. And I think that was an unfortunate for the field. Because even doctors today trip over the word palliative care. They almost can't say, I'd like you to see that mm, some, somebody who might provide a little <laughs> more support. Um, yeah, well, what's the name of that? Well, you know, sort of, we'll get you to meet the people. Yeah. It's very, very hard because people equate palliative care end with end-of-life end of care and with well, hospice. hospice. And yeah. probably everybody should understand the differences between. between all of those things. And my goal for this hospital is to meet the patients very early in their course, to have them know that there's a umbrella or an advanced care team that's there for them when they need it. Have them be introduced to the concept that there are additional things out in the community, there are resources for them, there are people that they can call that can make their lives better. There are in not that many things, but there are a lot that we can do with very little. And then maybe to step back for five years or ten years and just step in when life is getting tough, and the tough have to go shopping, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For care. It's true. That is one of the major barriers with palliative care. So, very well said. Um, in the emergency room, it's essential to have knowledge in symptom management, expertise in communication skills. Um, you often have very difficult clinical decision making. And in all of that, what is the nurse's role? Especially when considering integrating palliative care into the emergency room. Basic questions that are often asked when we talk about integrating palliative care, especially in a specialty area, is are we prepared for this? Do we have the staff? the manpower, the resources in order to overcome the barriers. And in a busy emergency room, will it even be possible to talk about end-of-life care decisions and discussions? Um, how, how, do, how can we make that part of the process and how can we make that work? Um, and there are some policies and processes already in place for children but how can we facilitate that and make it, you know, a normal flow for everybody? 
um, you know, is, is still a work in progress, I think. For, and I've only been here for not even four weeks, so I'm learning too, as far as how we're doing things in children. The emergency room, emergency nurses association position statement, and we have a copy of this, um, states that nurses perform a very important role in providing life-sustaining treatment as well as providing palliative and end-of-life care. Emergency nurses lead and manage collaborative efforts with physicians and other members of the healthcare team, endorsing philosophy supporting quality palliative and end-of-life care in the emergency setting. They should receive training, education, and mentorship on the topics of palliative and end-of-life care and collaborate with specialized palliative care providers. But emergency room nurses do assess and identify patients and families that may potentially benefit from this specialized care. And they often, if not always, facilitate family presence um, during assessment, treatment, and resuscitation based on the institutional policies and assist to develop those policies if they're not in place. In fact, the movement to have parents stay during resuscitation was started by a nurse, an emergency room nurse. And that has become common practice across the U.S. now. Emergency nurses use ethical <coughs> principles, including the involvement of their institution's ethics committees to assist in navigating ethically challenged, challenging situations. And they lead or participate in performance improvement projects to improve the care of individuals as well as to improve processes of care within across healthcare agencies. When uh, Vivian and I spoke earlier today, um, she said uh, that one of the points she wanted to make sure that um, we brought out was the, the um, difficulty in having this kind of communication with the patients and their families and that <coughs> nurses were the experts so that you at the bedside are often the ones that are explaining what the doctor just said and left after saying. Um, you know, you're usually at the bedside, sitting at the bedside, and typically it's not unusual for the family or the patient to turn around and say, what did he say? Or what did it mean? Um, so that in palliative care, we see that role as being pivotal. The, the one who establishes that relationship with the parent, with the patient or the parent, um, in order to have some really difficult conversations. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, identifying emergency room patients who can benefit from palliative care. Here in um, Children's, I understand that any child who has a pulse, which is a phys physician's order for life-sustaining treatment form, basically whether or not they want full resuscitation, modified resuscitation, or no resuscitation in the event of an incident outside of the hospital, um, that we maintain a copy of that form in a binder here in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, most of the children who have been seen through palliative care will be flagged in EPIC as a palliative care patient and would trigger looking to see if there's a pulse form. It is not unusual that families would forget to bring their pulse form mm -hmm. with them to the hospital. Having the pulse form in hand is not required to make it valid. They just have to tell you that it's a pulse form that they have a pulse form and this is their wishes. And that is how we are guided to provide care. Um, but it's not binding. So they it's could, not binding. Exactly. They could say, they, I, exactly. I, I want you to try everything. Exactly. I changed my mind. Exactly. And I have had not that binding. before where we got out the pulse form and it was basically do nothing and that, that they wanted And they changed done. their mm -hmm. mind. That's mm -hmm. not unusual mm -hmm. either. But it gives you a clue. But they're you in know, the process. They're in the process. Yeah. And, you know, that 
that is a very conflicting process. Absolutely. You know, um, there's a lot of emotion that goes into that. Mm -hmm. Can I just add that when somebody comes in and says, I don't want this child resuscitated and I didn't bring the post with me, I might just ask and make sure that they are the legal guardian. That's a good point. Because mm -hmm. if they are not and they didn't bring the post, I'm not. I'm pretty sure that they are not legally. You cannot follow. Their yeah, we have a copy of the pulses, though. I, I I don't think I've ever had it where somebody has come and talked about being on it, and not had a copy of it in the binder. I think previous to your arrival, she was really good about keeping but somebody them updated. Could come from and be brought in from another mm -hmm. hospital, mm -hmm. or ties a patient whose pulse is not here. Mm -hmm. So just a word to of, mm -hmm. of caution. Mm -hmm. right. And the pulse is, the, the binder is kept up in... Uh, By the church nurse area. Okay. Well, what do you do when you have parents that are divorced they each want something different? Then I would get um, your resources in line to help figure that out, whoever it would be, whether because you'd have to do the same thing just to, in providing care and who you talk to and who you don't talk to. Yeah. Um, it's the same, the same process. If one has complete custody, if they have shared custody, um, you're gonna, that's going to have to be um, figured out. And in the emergency, you know, in the true emergency, you're just going to focus on the child at that point and what's needed. Um, oftentimes those logistical things have to wait until you can get to it. But it's the same process. Now when you look at EPIC, um, if they have been identified as a patient in palliative care, where, do, where do, are we able to see that? Yeah, I don't think that? I've seen that before in EPIC. So I'm not sure. Does it it's show up it, under it, a certain Is it on the bulletin board the, at the top or at the? It was well. Where I've seen it is on the left side. If it has a tab for palliative care, mm -hmm. it's a patient that's been seen by. For, okay. Oh, it has okay. a tab. Perfect. Maybe yeah. we can look up one from the one of the pulse forms yeah. and see mm -hmm. if we can so, so we can recognize it. Not so all. Not all post children are palliative care children. Some mm -hmm. of the docs are very comfortable to talk to their families and get that form signed okay. without, without um, uh, our being involved. Most oh. of them we are involved, but there are some that we might not be. So it can be initiated in the emergency room then? Yes, yes. Legally, an, um, a pulse form can be initiated by a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or a physician. Our policy here is that we prefer the attending physician to um, complete the pulse with their patient, but if not able to or not present, uh, to be aware that the conversation is going and to make sure that he's in, in line with the plan of care for that particular child. Because um, we want to respect that relationship as well. Uh, but yeah, um, in fact, you'll see on the form that because it is a physician's order, but a nurse practitioner and a physician's assistant um, legally can authorize the pulse, which gives us a little bit more um, flexibility in getting them completed. So then, do you follow up in the ER like we have this binder? So do you come on? A what is it, monthly basis or something to find we, out who's been We're trying up? to figure out our actual processes. Um, Marta Friedman oh, is mm -hmm. a social worker with Palliative mm -hmm. Care, mm -hmm. and she will typically come down once a week and just check to make sure that the binder is up to date um, and that you have all the copies that we have mm -hmm. as well. So the, her primary, that's one of her primary responsibilities is making sure your binder is up to date. Everyone's on the same wing, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. But it should also be in the media tab in the patient's chart. And That's so what we'll have to look for because I'm not 100% sure that I, I have ever seen one with it in there. So maybe it's a new thing and I just haven't so seen it and I'm not recognizing you know how it. It's, I wonder if it's under more activities. Mm -hmm. Well, so we just we need to come familiar have, with it. I think yeah. that's an important yeah. thing for us what to What I have, and like I said, that. I'm brand new, so I've been spending a lot of time trying to get used to all the different Our tabs Epic, yeah. in EPIC. Um, and that's where I've seen it. If you 
click on a child who's been referred to palliative care than pal you know where it says um, overview, nursing overview, um, history notes, okay. Okay. and then it says progress notes, and then it, there's one little thing that says palliative care. Okay. Um, so, we'll look. so that's where I found it. The copy of the Pulse is supposed to be scanned and uploaded into the media oh, tab right. for every chart, for every mm -hmm. patient. Um, my auditing has shown that that has not been consistent. So we're working with um, whoever your IT department is, mm -hmm. I don't, HIS, to ensure that the scanners are capable of doing that. So what percentage of Children's Hospital theatric patients have this? I don't know the, no. the n you numbers know. yet. No. I don't know. I'm I would curious. Say, no, I, I, I'd be guessing. So I don't know. Okay. In terms of the total number of children's hospital patients? Like in our hospital. I think it would be a very small number. Small number. Okay. The number of patients in palliative care, it would be a much larger number. Also at the very top where the banners are under FYI, mm -hmm. the, if the child has a limited code or an A and D or something like that, you should see it right at the top as one of the one of the banners. And that should prompt you to go to the media tab and all the, pa and all the palliative care notes to get the background of the discussion, because that should be in there. But the um, media tab, I had understood that as soon as a post was signed, a copy was sent down to the ER, a copy was sent Ooh. down to HIS, and Mahuat had told me that they would have priorities for being scanned into the patient's if it's not happening, then I need to... Well, need to um, that, that's why we're getting a scanner. So that when we send them a copy, we're uploading it to the chart at the same time. And who has um, okay that? I don't know that name. It, I talked to an Isaac and a Greg. And who is in charge of medical records? No, I talked to HIS. I think we have and to get the one. EPIC person. We have to get Mahua to Okay, agree. all right. The, um, um, I was just going to say something. Oh, on the top, the top banner for the patient's information, one of the things that I've noticed is for code status, it will sometimes say prior. Um, often it'll say prior, and you actually have to click on that word, and it will bring up the history of the code status for that particular child. So. The child may be a full code, the child may have an A and D, or it may have a limited code, but you have to actually click on that to get to the history, to know what the actual last official code status was. So that's something we're also addressing because it should be the actual code status. You shouldn't have to click to go somewhere to find out what it is. How often are, is the pulse updated? Is yeah. that also yearly, or is doesn't it, ha it, it has doesn't to be? Have to. There's no time limit. There's no time. Oh. There's no time limit. It's up to the family. Now, yeah. every time they come in, we review it with them to make sure that they're the we're all the goals of care have not changed, or if they have changed, that the pulse is updated to reflect that. Okay. But what the it, actual form does not have an expiration date. And I suppose it would behoove us to if we know that they have a pulse to actually review it yes. when they arrive. Yes. So that if something does happen during their stay here that we're clear what our Right. And that's will be. one of the points is that if you know there's an advanced directive or a pulse that you would review it with them because often in in the moment of crisis they will call 911 and you'll find them and they'll come to the emergency room but once they're here they may realize we don't want another ICU admission. We just got home. We just want them home. Um, we had a patient recently who's home on hospice, but um, he has severe um, neurological and um, brain damage, so he has trouble keeping his sodiums uh, regulated. And be, due to that, it was um, decided to bring him to, back to the hospital to get him a bolus of saline to bring up his um, sodium level. But it was very, very clear the family did not want him admitted. And if we were following any of our usual pathways, he would have been admitted. Mm -hmm. um, but.
They wanted the symptom treated so he would have better quality of life. He wouldn't have the symptoms from the hyponatremia and still be able to go home because they did not want to change his goals of care. Mm -hmm. And by being able to communicate with the primary care physician, with Dr. Newman, and with the ER, that was facilitated and they had, an, uh, you know, they came in, they were here two and a half hours and they went home and they had nothing but great things to say about everybody's support. So that's what we'd like to see. And we all know parents can often change their minds. And that's okay. It's, it's that conflict that anyone would have facing the loss of their child. Um, children that you see in the emergency room that might not be part of um, the palliative care team should should be that palliative care team should be involved with are those with complex chronic conditions. Um, ED visits with difficult to control physical or psychological symptoms, declining, active declining in function, feeding, weight loss, um, increase in caregiver distress, uh, long-term needs requiring more support, um, and then later on I'll show you how to contact the palliative care team um, for an assessment or consultation or referral. Symptom management for end of life. Uh, these are the four main medications that we would utilize. Um, morphine is, we both said at the same time, our, one of our best friends. Um, and typically it is often used at the end of life and is very good for pain control. Atropine for sec secretions. Um, midazolam for pain, and then phenobarbital as well for secretions and or seizures. What other symptoms might you need um, helping controlling in the emergency room? 